Hello folks, my name's Lewis Akers and I'm a member of the Connor.co.uk editorial board and it's great to be joining you again for the second in our Region and Revolt video series where we'll be speaking to a selection of activists and scholars from West Asia and North Africa about the movements in the region. Uh, today I'm joined by uh, Joy Abe, um, who is a Lebanese researcher based in Geneva um, who's the founder of podcast um, Fire in These Times and a monthly newsletter called Humus for Thought. Um, he's also contributed to the uh, fantastic book, A Region in Revolt, uh, which is a writing about these uh, movements in West Asia and North Africa and is the inspiration for this series of uh, videos. Um, Joey wrote uh, alongside Jade, who was our previous guest, about the movements that are on the march in Lebanon. So today we'll be discussing that situation in Lebanon and a little bit of the historical background. So hello, Joey. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Perfect. Um, so I was thinking that we could probably probably go through this in a sort of chronological order and pull out some of the historical context using the question as I'm guessing, like myself, that many of our viewers will be probably relative novices when it comes to probably both the politics today and some of the history and background um, of Lebanon. Um, so I suppose just to just to start off, I mean, some of the sort of uh, 20th century history um, what sort of, could you give us a sort of idea of what the kind of the impacts of independence um, has been um, and how the civil war which happened um, after independence um, has had an impact on how sort of politics are conducted in Lebanon. So in the book that you, uh, you talk about this idea of like confessional democracies and consensus candidates, what do they mean for, mm -hmm. you know, people like myself who don't really have a grounding in the situation? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Lebanon declared independence in 1953 after roughly two decades under the French mandate. Uh, prior to that, we had obviously the long period under the Ottoman Empire. And that's it's during that time that the concept of a Lebanon, the nation state of Lebanon, uh, was basically thought about and, and created and so on. So in 1943, you did have the independence. And in the context of that independence, you had something called the National Pact. The National Pact was never really formalized. It was more of a kind of like a gentleman's agreement, if you want. Obviously, all of these were all men at the time. Um, where essentially you had this implementation of what would end up becoming called confessionalism, or what we just called like thought if and Ab, so like sectarianism. Okay. Um, that has changed throughout the years. It's not this like in the system in the 40s is not the same as the one in the 70s, and it's not the one as the one uh, since the 90s. And even more recently, there's been like change of laws and whatnot. And like the differences are a bit boring. It's essentially like different seats for different sects. And but like the essential gist of it is that we have a proportional system, more or less, uh, in which votes and therefore MPs are divided along sects. And the big three um, names, if you want, are the fact that the prime minister has to be a Sunni Muslim, the speaker of parliament has to be a Shia Muslim and the president has to be a Maronite Christian. It's a bit of a similar situation to the one that, that exists in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it's different in the sense that we're not also talking about ethnicities in Lebanon, we're only talking about sex. But the underlying logic is essentially that. Um, that, as I said, changed since between independence and the what ended up being the civil war, because like we have three entire decades in that and, and, and between them. In those three decades, of course, I'm summarizing here, we had everything from, well, the independence of the various um, Arab countries, Lebanon, Syria, and so on. Of course, you had the uh, establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 and the subsequent Nakba as well. And then you had all of the various uh, Israeli-Arab conflicts between the larger states like Egypt and Syria, Jordan, and so on, and Israel, which had impacted Lebanon in, in ways that I feel most people don't fully understand. Okay. We'll maybe get into it a tiny bit, although like most of it, most of this is pre-civil uh, war because we're talking about like in 1958 you had a, a conflict in Lebanon, you had obviously the 67 war, you had the 1973 war, and then in 1975 the eruption of what would end up becoming called the Lebanese civil war. Now the Lebanese civil war is kind of a misnomer. It's not one thing. You didn't have one war. It was multi multiple wars in one, the different phases of the conflict. Roughly speaking, between 72 and 75, sorry, 75 and 76, you had the first one, and it's called conveniently enough the two days war. Uh, 
after that, you had several other conflicts up until the point where you had the 1982 Israeli invasion. Before that, you had already uh, we had already witnessed the Syrian invasion as well by the by the Assad regime at the time. So by 1982, you already had two different invasions, or like you know that would that would have been the second one. But even in the 80s, you had multiple other conflicts as well up until the very last year, the very last few months of of the end of the war, and even for a few months after the Taif agreement, which officially ended the war, uh, you still had some bouts of violence in different episodes after that as well. So by 1990, 1991 even, that's when the bulk of that kind of violence where you had outright like militias and different armies and, you know, classical civil war, if you want, situation, that's when that mostly ended, like for the most part. And what you had instead is this Ta'if agreement. Ta'if is just the name of the city in Saudi Arabia where these warlords and some uh, oligarchs, they went there and they met and they made peace and whatnot. And they did so under specific conditions that we, um, like with the repercussions that we still live with today. In, in, during the signing of the Taif Agreement, you had the passing of the amnesty law, which forgave most crimes committed before that date. I believe it was like March 1990 or 1991, whatever it is. Everything before that was de facto forgiven. The only exception being if you had killed like prominent politicians or prominent religious leaders. But if you had killed everyone else, you were forgiven of your crimes. That allowed all of those form, former warlords um, to become part of the government because they had obviously accumulated all of the political capital and cultural capital and obviously financial capital. And they were much better prepared to enter a parliament, enter politics than any kind of independent voices, especially as when the war ended in Lebanon, it ended with the exception of Southern Lebanon, which was still under Israeli occupation. The rest of nominally uh, the Republic of Lebanon, as it was uh, and it still is officially known, was under what's called Syrian tutelage, which is a just a nicer way of saying occupation. Okay. And the people who uh, were chosen, and or at least they had to be tolerated and approved by the Syrian regime in order to run for parliament in the first place, were obviously you know friendly enough or not threatening, not radical, not they had to be business friendly. They had to be you know, don't ask too many questions kind of situation. And long story short, we're still living with that exact same uh, system. Many of those same people are still in power, if not them, their sons. Rafik al-Hariri, who was the giant of the 90s of, um, due to his business reconstruction that we'll get into probably, uh, when he was assassinated in 2005, his son Saad al-Hariri took over. Uh, you know, Samir Jaja was in prison during the 90s, and then when he was liberated in 2005, he also took over his party's leadership. Same for Michel Aoun, who is now president, who came back from exile in 2005, he took over his party's leadership. All of these people, with the exception of Hari, who is more the, like the oligarchy side of things, all of these people are warlords, or ex-warlords, or like their father were warlords, or their uncles were warlords. It's It's very much a war economy that was just allowed to uh, exist in a quote unquote post war context, which is why the 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 nomenclature of post war is a bit debated in, in, in these in the in that situation. So that's sort of it in a very, very simplified nutshell, obviously. Uh, and now we're you know three decades on, obviously, 2021, three decades since the Tariff Agreement. Last year I, I believe was the official three decades or something like that, or a couple of years ago. I keep on forgetting if it's 89 or 90 when they signed it. But, you know, basically three decades since that happened. And we're living in that same phase now. We're, we haven't moved from that phase. So just, uh, just on this idea of still being in the same sort of phase of uh, sort of thinking and doing things, I mean, what sort of impact has that, uh, has that sort of, has the civil war had on, I suppose, national consciousness? Because, like, for example, elsewhere in this book, um, there's the examples of um, Algeria and Iran where sort of revolutionary movements of the past are evoked to essentially back up the regime and give them a bit yeah. of, um, sort yeah. of credence and um, credibility. Um, but also the movements on the street have been able to try to reclaim some of that sort of national consciousness as well. So what sort of role does that sort of the civil war playing a sort of national consciousness in Lebanon? It, it sounds a lot more complicated in this situation. It is. For other yeah, it is. Mm, sorry. It is, yes. Um, I mean, the main big difference is that we don't have one revolutionary party that won any kind of war. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, the closest thing that we might have gotten to that was that between 75 and 76, uh, in the initial spark of that civil war, or what's being called a civil war, I usually just call it the Lebanese wars, um, you had a possibility of something along those lines happening because the coalition that was, that was I think in English, the name is simply like the Lebanese national movement or something, uh, which is, you know, this coalition of, of leftist uh, groups, some nationalist groups and the Palestinian uh, militias, um, well, they're all militias technically, um, were pretty close to almost winning that, that phase of the war. And in theory, all of the civil war, like, you know, you may, we may not have had the rest of what we now call the civil war. Okay. But what ended up happening then is that you had a military intervention by the Syrian regime to crush that coalition. And like, it's kind of a complicated story and, you know, I'm not necessarily a scholar of that specific period, but that's one of the reasons why you didn't have a, you know, a post-1979 Iran style situation in Lebanon. Another very basic reason is that Lebanon is just too diverse. It's not, there's no one dominant group, really. You have, uh, percentage wise, we don't really know who's the majority in terms of sex because the census is actually not allowed in Lebanon. Um, but, you know, roughly speaking, the way it is generally imagined is that you roughly have 30% Christians, 30% Shias, 30% Sunnis, and more or less the rest of the percentage would be the Druze um, religion, the Druze sect. Um, so you don't really have a situation where they can, like, you know, let's say the dominant Christian parties can utilize a, a single myth or a single foundational myth. They have a number of them but they don't, you know, agree between one another, which one it is, which one is the better one. So there's the, the story is more complicated in that sense. And obviously, even in those other cases, as I'm sure you know, since you, you know, you've read the book, it's also simplified, obviously, but it, it does create a cleaner timeline that's easier for a regime to use. Whereas in Lebanon, uh, first of all, like history textbooks stop in 1943, like at the date of independence, that's the last thing that the Lebanese people learn in school because pretty much every, everything after that is not technically agreed upon. Everything from the 1958 conflict, which saw an American intervention after invitation by the president, which was in the context of the president being anti-Pan-Arabism, and obviously you had Pan-Arabism at the time, you know, Gamal Abdel Nasser, all of those things. Um, everything from then, everything since then, the 1967 war, which Lebanon didn't really participate in, the 73 stuff, which Lebanon didn't participate in either, and then everything in the civil war and the 90s, none of these things are mentioned in Lebanese textbooks. And so there isn't much for them to, to use in terms of a coherent or coherent enough ideology in the same way that like the Iranian regime might, might uh, uh, like ha ha have more to use if you want in that sense. And it's a bit of a double-edged sword in some ways. Um, I mean, in many ways, but because they can't also use it, um, well, people as well can't really use something. You don't have a, a coherent narrative or a, a foundational myth that they can sort of say, well, this is, okay, this is my sectarian story, but we have a national story. Well, that national story is also contested. And those are, those are among the many uh, reasons, if not the primary reasons, why... Um, the, 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 very nation, the very idea of what is a Lebanese, who is a Lebanese and what is the Lebanese nation, a lot of people would argue, and I would tend to agree with that, that it's never been properly defined. And, you know, all nations are imagined communities, obviously, and, you know, all of these are social constructs, but usually you would have a bit more of an understanding of who is what and who comes from where and that sort of thing, whereas in Lebanon it's a bit more difficult. Okay, and uh, that's, that's perfect. Thanks very much, Joy. Um, I mean, just, I suppose, moving, um, you know, I suppose into the sort of post-Civil uh, War period um, mm -hmm. in a more concrete sense. I mean, it seemed to me that from reading the book that sort of privatization, uh, unlike, you know, uh, in, in probably a much more concentrated and in extreme way than many other places in the globe, um, has played a massive role in the sort of uh, post-Civil War um, sort of Lebanese context. Um, yeah. In the book, you mentioned that this is to, you know, uh, this was seen as a way to move past the deadlock to sectarianism and, you know, the different sects within government was sort of outsourcing the sort of restructuring of the economy uh, from these sorts of old kind of statist sort of focused regime to a more sort of private sector free market. Um, mm -hmm. 
So I was wondering if you could maybe talk a bit about that. You mentioned um, uh, Rafik there uh, earlier and the central role that uh, he played. And um, I was wondering if you could sort of talk about that a bit um, and how the sort of street movement has responded to this. Yeah. Okay. So I will, I will sort of start with like very concrete examples, basically. Okay. Um, you don't have public um, spaces in Lebanon. They don't really exist. You have a few of them sort of like, it, they kind of feel like tiny cantons within the cities and you have a tiny park here and, you know, that kind of thing. But you'd be hard pressed to find like a bench or, you know, a bus stop or that sort of thing. And that's sort of the, and you don't have, we don't have a train. That was, that, that was destroyed during the, during the Civil War, never rebuilt after that because the, well, they were all private. The, the railways were literally taken to be sold elsewhere and that sort of thing. Um, that's a, you know, an example, but it, it just symbolizes everything in the fact that in Lebanon, you don't have a concept of a public space. When we think of like the Hayyam Square in Baghdad or in Cairo, or, you know, I don't know, anywhere like, um, uh, I forget, Gezi Park in, in Istanbul, or like really most, most big cities or most whatever would have various uh, different parks, obviously. Yeah. Um, you don't have that in Lebanon. When we say Martyr Square, uh, if people just open like the map and they see where Martyr Square is, they will find a tiny, tiny section of it where there isn't a big parking because most of it is a big parking. And then you have like a Virgin Mega Store, and then you have the, you know, it's it's a completely privatized space, 100, almost 100% privatized space. And so that's, that's the context in which the post-war era is best defined, in my opinion, and even more than sectarianism. Sectarianism is, is useful as a framework, and it does color a lot of how politics happens in Lebanon, but it's not the only way things happen. And I would be very hard pressed to imagine how this kind of sectarianism that, you know, we, can, we would be talking about even more in this conversation, yeah. how it could be possible without the privatization that happened even before all of this was part of any kind of like, you know, teenagers consciousness, because you know, I grew up with that. Um, so privatization, when we speak of privatization, the main company that is spoken about in the context of downtown Beirut is Solidaire. You have other um, like iterations of that, like different models were used elsewhere in Lebanon. You had Elisar and what's now Dahye. So that's like, the, it's sort of like a very similar model, but instead of Hariri in downtown, you had like Hezbollah and Amal doing that in Dahye. Um, the idea is 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 a very think of it as like the most the easiest interpretation of what neoliberalism looks like. That's basically it. It's, it's yeah. just you sell off as much of the land. You you uh, they even like literally built over parts of the coastline. Now the coastline and most of Lebanon is completely destroyed or privatized uh, in order to create rent, in order to create more space, and you know you know you build shit on it and you sell it for rent and stuff. Um, that's, that, that, that was during the nineties and Rafiq Hari was sort of like the figurehead of it all, but he wasn't the only one who benefited from it. It's, it's the entire system that was built along that logic. And as I mentioned before, this was made possible through the, uh, quote unquote, Syrian tutelage. Um, that was the nineties, like in, in a nutshell, that was most of what happened in the nineties. At the same time, you had sort of like either the co-optation or the eradication of the unions which happened anyway during the civil war, uh, but that continued in the 90s, the co-optation of many of these unions, which is why like, you know, jumping 20 years later during the 2019 uprising and the revolution, have a lot of people trying to establish alternative unions. Um, they're still doing it to this day. It's, it's, only, it's only been a year and a half. Um, so like that, that was uh, privatized, that's, that's the general framework in which privatization happens. When I, when I uh, try and explain it, I usually start first from like the concrete examples of like, because most people in pretty much almost everywhere in the world would have some concept of what a public space looks like. And of course there are cities that are highly privatized as well, like in Beirut, but even fairly privatized cities like in New York, for example, you will have some kind of public space, you know, not just Central Park, but like some idea of a, of a public a bench, a metro, a, you know, what have you. Uh, that, that just doesn't exist in, in Lebanon, neither in Beirut nor in the rest of the country. Uh, 
And that affects a lot of, of how not just, um, you know, obviously day-to-day -day stuff, you have to use a car, you do get stuck in traffic, you can't just be somewhere if you want to just chill with your friends, you have to go to a cafe or to someone's house. You know, everything becomes uh, a transaction. You have to pay to use everything. You have to pay to be anywhere. You can't just be somewhere. And so during the uprising in, you know, October 2019 and uh, on and off since then, um, you had a lot of uh, attempts to reclaim these spaces. You had one, there's one op opera, for example, in, in downtown Beirut, that's basically, it's called The Egg, because it looks like an egg. And it, it was reclaimed and people like did some theater in it and there were some movies shown and most of it at like small scale. It didn't affect the four, five, six million people who live in Lebanon, yeah. but it was part of those attempts to recreate something that, that's uh, different from what we've experienced so far. And along those same lines, it's why you sort of have a nostalgia for like the train. And we hear like our grandparents, especially because our parents would have been in their teens when that started becoming dismantled during the war. But our grandparents, you know, they used to take the train to go to Jerusalem 348 or they would go to Aleppo or Damascus or what have you. And that's that's something that's very difficult for us to imagine because, well, we, we, we never had it. So, yeah. I suppose just, I mean, the this idea of the sort of reclaiming of public spaces, um, which seems to me anyway to be quite a central component of lots of the sort of movements during the Arab Spring, it yes. had even had an even more um, an even more concrete sort of impact and um, in Lebanon uh, because you know uh, the, the the reclaiming of these spaces they weren't reclaiming public spaces they were reclaiming privatized spaces yeah. for the public um, yes. so it's it's even more um, I suppose the point that's being made by that is even more uh, you know is even more impactful um, yeah. I mean, just in terms of, I suppose the, just just touching onto the Arab Spring and then the sort of uh, what you call in the book the sort of Arab Spring 2.0, these sorts of uprisings, protests over the last couple of years. I was wondering, I mean, what are the what sort of sparked the initial involvement of uh, the Lebanese movement in the initial Arab Spring, and how, what are the similarities between that and the new wave of protests? What are they? What were they responding to? Is there a continuum a line that draws them together or you know mm. there is there isn't a clear line um yeah. due to the simple fact that lebanon just had a different historical path than most of the rest of the region um you know very simply we don't have one dictator there's no one uh, person there's no one party dominating everything you don't have a hafiz or bashar there's no Gaddafi. there's no mubarak you know they don't exist at that scale. The, the, the concentration of power is not that, um, was never that concentration at the hand of a single party. Even to this day, you know, Hezbollah has more power than all of the others, but it's not the same as a Mubarak situation or as a, you know, even, even worse than Mubarak right now, the like CC situation where he really is the state. Uh, you don't really have that. It never really happened in the same way. So when 2011 happens, um, you did have some mobilizations on the streets in Beirut and other cities, but they were fairly small. The biggest protest that had happened, because Lebanon already had a massive protest in 2005, what's, what's okay. it's called the Cedar Revolution. Um, the Cedar Revolution is a very complicated thing. A lot of people would not be happy with my interpretation, I'm sure. But essentially, it, I mean, it started after the assassination of Rafik al-Hariri, and that long story short, ended up creating this binary March 14 and March 8 movements or parties, the movements, the coalitions. Um, it just named after the date in which the biggest protest of each camp was held. Okay. So March 8 was held uh, after, so, okay, let me re um, like make a timeline. On February 14th, 2005, you had the assassination of Rafiq Hariri who was prime minister of Lebanon. And he was prime minister for most of the period since 1990 or 1991, I think, something like that. Um, there was just a couple of years where he was not prime minister, but he was for the most part prime minister for all of that period. So his assassination was a pretty significant, other than being very dramatic, like the bomb was pretty horrible and pretty massive and you know killed like 21 other people and stuff. Um, it was also the first time we had something of this scale since the Civil War. So for my generation, this was the first big thing. This was the very first um, 
violent event. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be the last. That, uh, so February 14th. Then on March the 8th, you had a, um, a, a coalition led by Hezbollah and Amal and a number of other parties opposing the then increasing anti-Syrian regime rhetoric that was developing in Lebanon. So they were the ones who, uh, if you want, rose up to say like, you know, we support Syrian tutelage. Of course, they wouldn't call it occupation. They would call it tutelage. They would call it uh, even like brotherly support or whatever other terms they would like to use. But that, that was their uh, point of view, if you want. Six days later, like on March 14th, that's when you had the counter uh, protest and that ended up becoming the bigger one. And long story short, the Syrian regime or the Syrian army was expelled from Lebanese territory, like I think a month later or something. Uh, not just through Lebanon, obviously. There was a lot of international pressure for that to happen as well. So that, that's 2005. Um, since then, you know, we had different events, different situations, but like in 2006, you had the war between Israel and Hezbollah in which the damage caused by the Israeli army against the civilian population was pretty severe throughout the country, focusing on uh, regions where quote unquote Hezbollah dominates, but not just limiting itself to that. And even if it only did limit themselves to the region, which it didn't, uh, they targeted like civilians and bridges and schools, and it was it was a pretty gruesome uh, situation. Two years later, you had the, what's called the 2008 conflict. Uh, some people call it like a mini civil war because it didn't last very long, but it, it had the hallmarks of a potential larger scale civil war, okay. in which, uh, long story short, Hezbollah took over parts of Beirut and not Lebanon militarily after its telecommunication network was threatened by the then Lebanese government, which was being dominated by March 14, and Hezbollah being in March 8. Um, when 2011 happened, there wasn't anything within Lebanon that had changed that much. You didn't have a kind of, uh, you know, the, the situation was already new, if you want, by, by our standards. Like 2005 was just six years, six years uh, past. In the context of the other uh, countries, you know, Syria, I think the, the coup d'etat that what Hafez was in 1970, you know, where, which I don't remember what the others, but they were like from the 70s and from some of them from the 60s and early 80s. So they were um, rising up against like established dynasties and established families and established armies and, you know, concentrated forms of power. In Lebanon, you didn't really have that in, in the same way. So in 2011, what ended up actually happening was you did have a small scale protest in Lebanon, but for the most part, the scapegoating of, in my opinion, the scapegoating of Syrian refugees who by the end of 2011 were already reaching uh, Lebanon, mostly around the, in the eastern, uh, like in eastern Lebanon, like around the border, because most of them were from that side of that border as well. Like they were not far away from, from their homes. Um, that successfully, that card, that fear card that the, the establishment would use, like, you know, at least we're not Syria. At least th there is no war here. So, like, basically, it's, it's a way of saying, like, don't ask too much. Don't, don't, um, don't rise up. Don't, uh, you know, don't create a revolution, obviously. Um, that more or less worked uh, because the standards of livings were okay. They were not amazing, but they were fine. People could get by for the most part. Um, the, the inequalities were already increasing. That was like prior to 2011, but they were like stable enough that the usual forms of power were able to maintain themselves through coercion, through uh, like what we call WASTA, which is like clientelism, you know, buying people off essentially. You have an, an entire network a percentage of the Lebanese population that depends on these various parties for their daily subsistence. They can get like a monthly salary or, or maybe their kids can go to school for free or at a discounted rate or like hospitals are more accessible, you know, whatever it is. In the absence of a public, in the absence of a common or a, you know, there's no welfare state, for example, in the absence of all of that, it's easier to then have like tinier versions of that, that not even compete with one another because they're not uh, addressing the same clientele, so to speak. But everything, like even in the language I'm using, all of this is the language of business. All of this is the language of, you know, it's a privatized language. We're not talking about citizens here. We're talking about customers. 
And that's how a lot of post-war Lebanon has been run. And the, the leaders do that. And in many ways, we have also internalized this. Come 2015, four years after the initial start of the Arab Spring, that's when we had the biggest protest by, by, since 2005. But 2015, the difference between 2015 and 2005 is in 2015, you didn't have either of the two camps, March 14 or March 8, really supporting it. They would kind of pay lip service, but it was largely an independent protest. It was largely, uh, I mean, it was sparked by the waste crisis at the time. That's why it was called you stink. There was like a direct parallel between like the actual stinking of, you know, garbage and the, pol the political class, essentially. It makes a bit more sense in Arabic. Um, when, so, you know, that happened and it didn't succeed in the sense that, you know, no one was kicked out, the government stayed in place, but that sort of laid the seeds for what were what was to come. And even the mistakes that they committed in 2015, and I was part of the organizers, so like that we committed in 2015, um, for the most part were learned since, not fully, and it's not, it's not perfect now either, but I will get into the details of the mistakes uh, when, when we speak about 2019. Yeah. Uh, but 2015 it was sort of like the initial seed that our generation, anyway, when you started seeing a youth dominated movement, that's when it really started. Then you had the elections in 2016, 2018. You saw a bit of that movement as well around like independent candidates and all of that. But when, because they didn't manage to get anyone really in, in power in uh, actual positions of power it didn't solve really anything. And come 2019, October 17th, 2019, various other factors created or led to what would end up becoming the, the revolution in 2019. Thanks very much. And I, I suppose just to move on from uh, 2019, um, mm -hmm. I suppose we've, there's a lot, a lot's happened since 2019. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and the, I suppose there's been the, there's been the coronavirus pandemic um i mean what I, I suppose that alongside um we've seen recently uh, and also uh, since 2019 um a series of applications to the imf for loans um as far as i understand there's been further privatization um and there's been massive you know economic impacts on actual on normal people um you know the sunday telegraph at the weekend was reporting you know uh, that people are, you know, absolutely destitute because of the situation that the country's in. I was wondering what sort of um, impact sort of COVID-19 has had on the movement um, since mm -hmm. 2019 um, and also what these sorts of wider uh, impacts are and whether they might spark another wave of protests um, and sort of focus energies, you know? Yes. Um... Well, as it happens, we're recording this one day after a different waves of protests have started in Lebanon again. Okay. Um, where, where those lead, I'm not entirely sure. Obviously, it's too soon to tell. But they have a very similar vibe, if you want, to October 2019. It's decentralized. It's all over the place. It's, you know, roadblocks, burning tires, that sort of thing. It's kind of the same... Um, um, same scenario in, in many ways and the people who were in power back then for the most part are the same people in power today as well it hasn't really changed on that front either so october 2019 what happened that week is is very revealing because what you had was a series of wildfires on october 13th and 14th i believe especially those were two, two very bad days in which roughly speaking lebanon lost its annual average or something, I'm not entirely sure of the numbers, it was a pretty significant number. Like it lost its annual average of key losses in something like only a couple of days. So like it doubled in a couple of days or something like that. And you know, it's a, it's a mountainous country, quite a lot of trees and, but it's small. So like it had, it had a pretty, pretty massive impact. But the response of the government um, is what was one of the things that ended up being the, the spark that led to the, the, the uprising on October 17th. Because the government uh, didn't have any firefighting helicopters, you had like two or three of them that were like, um, like they went, they, they were not being maintained, and so they couldn't be used. And the government ended up basically asking foreign powers, I believe Cyprus, Greece, and Jordan, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to send like some help. And they they helped uh, quench the fires. They even used like riot, uh, you know, trucks, the, the the water cannon stuff. They used those. Um, and other than that, it was basically a bunch of volunteers who turned it off, uh, turned it out, sorry. 
yeah, like because the civil servants are not paid or they were not paid at all back then, I think. You had even like volunteers from various regions, including from the, the Palestinian refugee camps. Um, and then it rained. So like we were very lucky, essentially. It rained at some point and it turned out, uh, turned out most of the fires. The very same day of when that was still happening, that like there were still wildfires, the government decides, and I believe they didn't even announce it. I think if I, if I remember correctly, we learned about it like through one, like one of the newspapers or something, that they were going to impose this WhatsApp tax. Okay. Now, they didn't call it a WhatsApp tax. They call it, you know, voice over protocol tax, whatever. But like most people at the time used WhatsApp. Um, now it's shifting a bit towards Signal, I think. But it's still mostly WhatsApp. Um, and that caused the outrage for the simple reasons that WhatsApp is for free. Like there's no actually, you know, there's no actual cost on WhatsApp. And Lebanon has like one of the slowest internet connections in the world. There's no 24 seven electricity in most of the country with the exception of like one part of Eastern Lebanon. And I think a few others, but that's that like most people don't have 24 seven electricity and they don't have 24 seven running water and definitely not drinking water either. Um, that felt like essentially like the step too far. Yeah. And that that kind of was the spark. I, a lot of commentators focus too much on that, I think. Um, but like lots of things happened before it. And it wasn't just that, obviously. But it was sort of just like adding insult to injury. Really. Like, why, why would you tax something like that's already for free? And the concept of taxes in Lebanon is very controversial. Not just not the concept of taxes. People might be on board with it in in general but like for what like what is you know what is then being given back there's as i said there's no public space there's the public schools are not the best ones most people who can afford it including like my own family they send their kids to private schools yeah there's only one public university everything else is private universities and the better ones the public university is pretty decent uh for the budget that it has that's the problem it has a low budget so you know, you add taxes and people don't see any kind of return on those taxes and they get pissed. And that's that's what ended up happening. The government justified it or tried to justify it by appealing to this and to this thing that, you know, we need to reform. We need to get some money back into the 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 what's it called in English? Like the yeah, like having a fund that we can then distribute or whatever. Like that's that sort of things that they were trying to to put forward. But you know, 30 years of lived experience, people didn't really have a good reason to believe that. And that ended up becoming the October 17th uprising. And that's what, but that's why it's very different than, uh, you know, the Arab Spring. It, it, it took a different trajectory. It took a different, uh, the causes were not the same. And Lebanon already had a civil war. Lebanon already had a conflict. So like the risks of uh, what happened in Libya, or what happened in Syria, or what happened in Bahrain or in Yemen, uh, were not the same because, like, the memory of like what would happen if we like uh, start shooting one another is still very fresh in Lebanon, and so that was enough to not let that happen, in my view. I, other people might disagree with that, but generally speaking, that's that's that. I think that's what happened. Perfect. Thank you. And. Um... I mean, just just to touch on, I suppose, a few broader um, questions. I mean, what is the sort of nominally the sort of, or the impact of nominally being a democracy? Uh, does mm -hmm. that have on the movement? Because um, I suppose there's there's lots of places uh, in the world where there's big street movements, um, but with very restrictive sort of authoritarian regimes. Which is nominally um, Lebanon is a democracy, although for all the reasons you pointed out, it probably isn't as democratic as it should, could, could be or should be. Mm -hmm. So what, what does that give the movement more opportunities? Does it afford them the ability to organize much more freely? Uh, it does. Yeah. It's easier to organize in Lebanon than in most of the region. I think that's, that's fair to say. Um, obviously, obviously the standards are very low there, but yeah. that, is, that is accurate. It's an accurate statement. The, the kind of the devil is in the details, essentially. The problem in Lebanon is that we have a democracy. It is nominally speaking a democracy, but it's a democracy in which the actual pool in which you can vote for is restricted in advance. It's sort of like for different reasons how Iran is technically a democracy, but it's not. You know, it's technically a republic, but it's also a theocracy. So like, you know, people can vote, but 
they have to be priorly and they have to be approved by the the the, the ayatollahs in in Iran. You don't have that in Lebanon. It's not that that rigid and it's not that top down. But you do have a de facto situation where the various uh, groups, you know, it's kind of like a mafia system. They have their territories. They have their uh, clientele, as I mentioned before. They have their people. They they treat them as their people, like they are their representatives of the Shias, of the Christians, of the Sunnis, of the Druze. Um, and they speak on their behalf. And they say, like, uh, we're doing this for the Christians, we're doing this for the Shias, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in theory, like, if we have, we're supposed to have elections next year, if they don't postpone those, because they had postponed the previous ones, I think, three times. And we did end up having a recent election a few years ago. But again, the pool by default, like, you know, you don't have, not anyone can run everywhere because if you don't have a, let, let me give like semi concrete examples, I do get confused with the details, but if you're in one part of uh, Beirut, one of the areas of Beirut, and you would have, let's say five MPs assigned to that area, uh, maybe two of them have to be Shias, maybe one of them has to be Christian, maybe another one has to be a different kind of Christian or whatever. And so, the, and to add, to complicate that even more, you don't vote where you live you vote where your family is registered. So a lot of people who live in Beirut can't vote in Beirut. I, you know, I, I can vote in Beirut and I don't live in Beirut because my family is registered in Beirut. And so a lot of people, you know, independent, progressives, whatever, people who went to university in Beirut and who ended up becoming, you know, more liberal or progressive about things or whatever, they can vote in that where they live. And that creates a disconnect because they can go back to their hometown, you know, where their parents live or their grandparents live, but they may not know the area as well anymore, or they may not be as familiar, or they don't have that direct impact in the sense that you're voting for your local councillor, or you're voting for your local MP or whatever, like in the UK and Scotland. Um, that's a big problem. And so we can call it a democracy because in theory, we can get progressives elected in theory this is possible it is legally possible yeah but we also have to calculate in advance that we get progressive from certain sects we need to have a progressive who is shia there we need to have a progressive who is christian there we need to have and they can't just be who they are they can't just be progressive we're not voting for them just on the basis of like their platform or their ideology or whatever in addition to all of that, you also need to do basically a mathematical calculation as to where you can get your, the person that you want. And they are much better at playing at that game because it's their game. Yeah. And so when we try and play that game and we tried it uh, during the last, the municipal elections and uh, the parliamentary elections, we tried and a lot of people had pretty decent candidates. Not all, like, I'm not a fan of all of them, but like definitely better than the current ones. And in theory, they could have won, but they didn't because we don't have the institutional backing. Like we're running against the government. The government is, is electing itself at the end of the day. So they have all of the resources that a government has. And you don't have an independent body that you know uh, assigns X percentage for funding for campaigns or you know that's, none of that happens. You don't have all of the even TV channels are privatized. So you have their, you know, Hezbollah's TV channel and uh, the Free Beat Caliph Movement's TV channel. And of course, they would urge their people or their viewers to vote for those candidates, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so it ends up becoming a sort of more of a show of a democracy rather than what you might call a democracy. And even by the flawed standards of most democracies, because obviously democracy is always flawed, this is like a different step to the point that you can easily argue that it's not really a democracy. Okay, that's that's really good to understand. Um, and I mean, just to, I suppose, just to sort of build on this, um, and hopefully to finish off as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in the book, you mentioned this idea of um, that the sort of that the, the people aren't um, that the, there's this belief in Lebanon, among the general public, as well as among the, the elite that the people aren't sort of growing up enough, in a sense, uh, aren't, you know, intelligent enough to govern themselves there's, there's basically no adults in the room that's what the, yeah. the belief that there's no adults in the room um so i mean i was wondering if you could touch on just that to finish off a little bit um what, what that means what that looks like in practice how that affects the way that politics is actually done well given that we it's been you know the civil war happened in 19 started in 1975 
And even if one assumes that before then things were all rosy, which they, you know, they weren't, um, you didn't really have any like long lasting period in Lebanon in which people had what you might call like stability or peace yeah. or whatever, um, giving people enough time to even organize or to think of like, what could a different Lebanon look like or whatever. For the most part, on and off, ups and downs, it wasn't always the same, of course, you've had a state of emergency, a de, a de facto state of emergency, sometimes a legal state of emergency, sometimes it's just de facto. Uh, for most of our history, Lebanon was declared independent in 1943. As I said, as of 1948, you already had the Israeli-Arab wars. Lebanon only might, like, only barely uh, participated in that, but it's part of the Arab world. It was affected by all of this as well. 58, 67, 73, 75, you know, then all of those until 1990, and then 2005, and then 2006. In 2000, you had the liberation of the South. You know, all of those periods, we're only talking about like maybe a decade uh, between one event and the other. And usually it's even less, less than that. So there has been a resulting cynicism, if you want. A, there is a, a very deep cynicism in Lebanon as to what is possible and what isn't. It's very like one of my earliest activist memories, if you want, and I, I've, I've mentioned that story a number of times, uh, was I think 16 or 17, and I was participating in a march for parts of something called Save Beirut Heritage. Okay. And it was to pre uh, preserve some of the heritage that was being destroyed uh, by these privatization forces, Solidaire in that case, it was in downtown Beirut. And I remember very clearly this kind of like this old lady on the sidewalk or whatever telling me like, don't waste your time, they're going to destroy it anyway. And it's that sort of like, it's a fatalistic um, worldview, essentially. Now, not everyone is like that, Peter. Obviously, people are, you know, diverse and whatever. Yeah. But there is this sort of like stream of cynicism that exists throughout the country. And that facilitates the notion that what you really need in Lebanon is a strong man. What you really need in Lebanon is a single person, of course, always imagine as a guy uh, who can take over things, you know, an army general or whatever. And army generals in Lebanon, it's usually not, not really understood, I think, have had a pretty prominent role in government. The previous president before this one was an army general uh, chosen as a consensus candidate. And this current president, Michel Aoun, was an army general during the civil war as well. He's literally called general, like that's literally what they call him. And so that's something that that's very often. <laughs> Excuse me. Come here, come here, come here. Well, we have a dog. <laughs> um, that's something that is 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 pretty obvious, you know. Like, and so there are there is a segment segment of the Lebanese population that genuinely believes that what we need in the country is an army general. What we need we need in the country is is someone like a strongman and whatever. The problem with that is that you will have to agree on which strongman to use and from which sect, and you know you'll have the entire Lebanese problem anyway. Have like taking part in those calculations, so I don't think it's a very very serious um, situation, but it still colors how a lot of people approach the the very notion of what is possible in Lebanon, and it it creates a cynicism in the sense that you genuinely believe that you cannot do anything, like you can't do much. Your, your power is very limited. You are unable to, to, to really affect things. You are, because the last time we had the vote, which was the first time in almost a decade, the one of a few years ago, we did get quite a lot of, of votes and we still didn't get any MPs in power because of the first past the post system in Lebanon. Like you get 60%, you get all of them, you know, that sort of thing. Um, that's sort of it in a nutshell. There's, there, I can get more into it in details. But it's something that uh, the October 2019 uprising and everything that's been happening since, because as I said, like yesterday, we saw a potentially what would end up becoming a second wave of that. I'm not a big fan of waves and stuff, but like just using it as, as a shorthand. Um, potentially that might, they, you know, that might be the second wave of, of that uprising, of that revolution. They have to contend with those problems. They have to still find ways to resolve it because we're not just dealing with the army and with Hezbollah and with the government and with the cops and the internal security forces. 
we're also dealing with like our families, our neighbors, our our um, um, just environment in general. These things are very widespread across the country, across sects. And that's why it's not easy to tackle them. And that's why what happened on October 2019 surprised a lot of people. It even surprised me, to be honest. I, I, I was a bit more cynical before than, to be honest, than I am now. I'm still a bit pessimistic, but I'm not cynical. I think there's a, there's a, there's a very crucial difference between these two. And most other people in Lebanon, this is me completely interpreting, obviously, I would venture to guess are between those two uh, worldviews, between f- pessimism and, and, and cynicism. Pessimism can be useful, can make, can make you realistic about things. Optimism can be dangerous and it can be useful depending on how it's used. Cynicism, I feel, only benefits those in power. And that's something that we, can, we still need to tackle in Lebanon. As, and I suppose just in terms of like the sort of street movement, um, I suppose it's not just in that context, it's not just a statement um, against the government, but it's also uh, the, the street movement is also a statement against this widespread belief that the people cannot govern themselves and cannot <laughs> think critically or engage in politics and organize. So it's it's really quite, a, I suppose, quite a, a groundbreaking thing to be to have happened and to do and something that could have much wider impacts on how people see themselves and the political world around them. So how they sort of negotiate with that. It's very new. It's very important to remember that it's all very new. Like between, we had obviously, of course, October 2019, but like by, you know, five, six months later, you already had the initial phases of the pandemic. And that didn't really leave much room to grow for most protests, um, most, let's say, protesters who, or even would be protesters in Lebanon. What, what you saw, like what we saw on, on the streets are like, I, I sort of describe them as like street negotiations. You had people who may not have been like revolutionaries. You know, they may not be, some would be conservative, some liberal, some more progressive leaning, what, what have you some genuinely very sectarian, some really religious, some atheists, some really all a cross section of the society, um, meet each other on the squares. And that's something due to everything I just mentioned about like privatization and everything doesn't really happen, doesn't really happen. And so that initial phase is, was the, the bit where you really saw on the street supporters of the Lebanese forces mingle essentially with supporters of Hezbollah. Yeah. Now they didn't necessarily like one another, you know, they didn't necessarily chat up or say hi or whatever, you know, it's, it was, but they had a common goal. They had a common thing to focus on. The problem is that the hold that the certain parties has on a percentage of the population is still pretty significant. And so what you had then is a, a withdrawal, not fully, but a partial withdrawal of what some people call like the Shia streets. I don't really like using those terms, but because Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, like did personal direct intervention. He went on television, like I think four or five times to say like, get out of the streets, go back home. And he ha- he still has quite a lot of influence. He's not just a political leader, he's a sheikh, he's a Sayyid. So he's also a, a cleric, a religious figure. And that has slowed things down in the sense that it has allowed so let, let me put it this way. <clears throat> One thing that anti-sectarians in Lebanon try and always do is make sure that they cannot be co-opted. So is make sure that they can't be said that they are pro-March 14 or pro-March 8, those two binaries that were formed in 2005. The way to do that is to make sure that you always have a, a decent percentage of people who are visibly from different sects. So that, you know, you will have on the streets, people chanting stuff like, you know, Shias and Sunnis united, Christians and Muslims united, whatever, what have you. Um, That becomes more complicated to do when you have different parties that have hegemony over a percentage of different sects. So like Hezbollah and Amal with with the Shia population, the Free Patriotic Movement, the Lebanese forces and the Falangists with the Christians, the Future Movement with the Sunnis and the so-called Progressive Socialist Party with, with the Druze it's very difficult to get up off of that because you may not like the party, but you will have a cousin who's in the party. You will have an uncle who's in the party. You will have, you know, it's a small country. The neighbors are even smaller. 
a lot of people know one another and it's very easy you know to to essentially treat your neighbor as your enemy if you're going against the state i'm simplifying here but that that's something that can happen a lot that that's something that's in the back of people's minds if you want or at least that's part of the fears that we might have and so it creates this additional barriers and it's one of the reasons why unless things get really bad which is kind of what's happening at the moment yesterday you had a different devaluation of the even worsening devaluation of the lebanese pound it it reached 10000 lebanese pound to the dollar it used to be 1500 prior to the crisis so in a year and a half it went from 1500 to 10000 uh, meaning basically like the, the monthly minimum wage is something like $68 at this point or something like that, something very, very tiny. Um, like maybe that might be something that breaks those links, those clientelist links, which, you know, to make, to have clientelist links, you need money. You need to give people money. You need to provide services in, in, in one way or another. If the money runs out, not entirely sure what comes next. They may still find a way to bring some money, but it may not be enough. So, you know, there may be ups and downs and there, you know, all of these things may happen. So what I would say is a lot of things are likely going to happen between when we're talking now and, for example, the next time we have the elections, whether they're next year or whenever they are, just because there are just too many different factors and not just Lebanese ones. You have regional factors as well. That's perfect. Well, um, thanks very much for joining me today, Joey. Uh, that was really good. Um, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we can get you back uh, maybe next year to discuss the elections, maybe to discuss the movement if it's advanced uh, over the next sort of year or so. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, to everybody else who's been watching this, uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Um, and hopefully you've enjoyed listening to this as much as me and learning about what's going on in Lebanon, what's happened in the past. Mm -hmm. It's given you a little bit more clarity um, and I think that Joe, you've been, you know, concise and eloquent in your overview of the situation. So it's it's been a pleasure to listen to. Um, if you've enjoyed this, um, you can watch our future videos in this series, um, or you can view our other content at conter.co.uk or contercast uh, at YouTube. But thanks very much, and we will see you next time. Bye.